Tim, welcome to Australia. Terrific to have you on uh, Conversations. Uh, you're a freelance writer in Britain. Uh, you've been the editor of the commentary pages in The Times, and they're, of course, legendary. Uh, you're a very astute observer of what's happening in Western societies in general and in your own country in particular. Where's Brexit going? My goodness, I've come to Australia, John, to escape from Brexit. <laughs> Um, but thank you, first of all, for the warm introduction and for having me on your um, in this conversation. But um, the vote for Brexit was a huge moment, I think, in, in, in British history. It was you know, the largest vote of its kind, largest popular vote for... I mean, more people voted for Brexit than voted for Margaret Thatcher, voted for Tony Blair. Uh, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people who don't normally vote, came out to the polls to vote for this great opportunity to leave the European Union. A real, I think, restoration of the nation state as a sovereign nation, not overseen by foreign courts, able to control its borders, a master of its own destiny, just you know, rights and freedoms that Australia takes for, for granted. And uh, the political class promised that whatever the result, uh, this was a once in a generation decision that they would implement what the people decided. Now, the, uh, the victory for leaving the EU was not huge, 52 to 48%, but it was decisive. And uh, the, there was a, still a there obligation there to honour the referendum result, but 75% of the current members of the House of Parliament voted for Remain, and a large number of them still haven't come to terms with the result and are still trying to resist that historic decision. And um, not only, I think, is the Brexit project, therefore, in danger. I think faith in democracy is in danger as well. Um, we should worry everybody. Well, it is deeply concerning, isn't it? Because even the idea of having a second referendum would be treated by many, many Britons, I would have thought, as a denial uh, of their right to have their say in the democratic process. Mm. And one wonders how they would then participate in British society, what attitudes they would then take. Well, some people probably, of those people, particularly those people I mentioned who don't normally vote in elections but thought it was worth voting in the EU referendum, probably won't vote again. And I've been out on the, on the doorstep in recent weeks before I came here, and there's real anger. People are very angry at Parliament's failure to deliver uh, this um, uh, decision to leave the European Union. Now, I suspect a lot of the Remainers, a lot of the parliamentarians who are denying the referendum, won't mind the idea of Brexiteers not voting again. But the other danger is that actually some of these people will keep voting, but they won't vote for the mainstream parties. They'll vote for increasingly extreme parties. Extreme parties that really are trying to throw the whole Westminster system of democracy up in the air and replace it with something God knows what, literally God knows what. And um, that possible ushering in of an era of extremism should worry anyone. And I think that you're absolutely right about the dangers of a second referendum. And I think uh, those people who are trying to resist the will of the British people as expressed in that referendum should know that they're playing with fire. It does raise a lot of issues, uh, but come to, let me come to one. The idea you've really raised there, the re assertion of the idea of nationalism yep. versus transnationalism. Mm. It's a red hot debate, one not really understood in Australia. Mm. Uh, let me start this way. Is there a, a good form of nationalism and a bad form of nationalism? I guess it's obvious that there's a bad form, yep. but what's good nationalism, justifiable nationalism look like? Yeah. Well, I think you, one way maybe of answering this question is to look at European history. And I think it's why Britain fundamentally has a different view of the nation state and the European project than most nations on the continent. For Britain, uh, national independence and self-determination you know, is uh, incredibly connected with the war that Winston Churchill led against Nazism. It was Britain standing alone for a year with you know, Commonwealth uh, Empire allies against... Uh, what was the greatest threat to human civilization of, of perhaps of all time, posed by Adolf Hitler and, and Nazism. Our general view, I think, of the nation is, is a good uh, idea. But of course, in Europe, they remember the constant um, 
conflicts caused by um, nationalistic leaders. And it is understandable, perhaps, that they therefore see uh, moving away from national self-determination to what is a pooling of sovereignty in the European Union as, as a good thing. And that really is at the heart of the divide, I think, between Remainers and Leavers in the UK. Uh, Leavers want Britain to be back on the world stage playing its full part. And I think a lot of Leavers, a lot of Remainers, forgive me, a lot of Remainers see Britain as a nation past its best. It's a nation in decline. It's a middle ranking power, uh, a nation all too linked with ideas of the superiority of Western civilization, ideas that they're, they're uncomfortable with. And they want Britain submerged in this, um, in this European project. And much more than economic issues, I think it's that view of the nation, a view of whether there's something special and better about Britain and Western civilization that's driving the levers and something more humble, you could say, something more negative about those uh, historical features that's driving Remain. It almost raises this issue uh, that, as some people now put it, in the West, the West's greatest enemy is the West. Yeah. There yeah. are so many people who self-loathe their culture. Yeah. It's funny that it comes, though, at an age when most people are reluctant to own any of their own failings. The old idea that we ought to be modest because we're all a mixture of good and bad. Mm -hmm. There's an enormous self-righteousness and now amongst a lot of the people who at the same time want to say our culture is terrible. How did that happen? How long have we got <laughs> to talk about that? But you will have seen, I think it was a debate in Australia as well, but we have had those terrible uh, bombings and attacks on the churches in Sri Lanka recently, um, following the terrible events in New Zealand. And quite rightly, after the terrible events in New Zealand, world leaders talked about it being as a, an attack on Islam. Mm. And there was almost, there, there was a ready acceptance, and I, I wouldn't quarrel with this, that there was legitimate questions to be asked about extremist uh, Westerners uh, and what responsibility we might have for uh, what ha happened in Christchurch. But after the Sri Lanka attacks, there was a reluctance to even recognise that this was an attack on churches. There was a reluctance to recognise that it was jihadi elements that had um, perpetrated these attacks. I don't even remember, but um, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton in their tweets wouldn't even use the word Christians. They talked about Easter worshippers. And uh, for some reason there is an embarrassment um, about what I think is some of the best aspects of Judeo-Christian Western civilization. This isn't about... This isn't about white supremacy. People seem in a rush to conflate Western civilization with white supremacism. All sorts of people of different backgrounds and colors were part of Western civilization. It's a, it's a set of values of democratic liberal principles and uh, deep in our universities now, deep in so much of the media culture is a reluctance to say that, you know, our civilization is is a very good one. It's flawed, it has problems, but we should be defending it. And we think actually it's superior to alternatives. That seems to be almost one of the most controversial things you could possibly say in so many newsrooms and uh, university lecture halls. Let's tease this out a little bit. Uh, Blaise Pascal, you know, mm. the, the brilliant French mm. thinker and writer, observed very simply that men hate religion. And of course by that he meant Christianity. Yep. He wasn't talking about anything else in the context of the time that he was writing in France. Men hate religion for fear it may be true. Is there something in our makeup that wants to deny the concept of truth if it's uncomfortable? If it doesn't suit our worldview, if it doesn't suit where we're sitting at the moment? I think at a fundamental level, that's true. And I think it's true in so much of our political discourse at the moment. There seems to be an unwillingness to wrestle with facts. People seem so dug into their uh, political, philosophical, cultural positions uh, that, and they can now, in a, in a media culture where there are so many voices, they, they can find voices and arguments that reinforce what they want to believe. 
And, the, 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 and I think this is not just true, true on the left, on the liberal side. I think we can be guilty of it on the right, conservative classical liberal side as well. Um, what, one of the, my biggest worries about the West in the populist age is uh, following some very extraordinary election results. Um, in a time when technological, cultural, economic and social change is happening simultaneously, nearly everyone thinks the same as they did before these events happened. Newspaper editorials are spinning the same lines, think tanks are coming out with the same uh, ideas and policies, politicians are repeating the same ideological positions. You know, if facts are changing on the ground and we are thinking exactly as we did before uh, these events occurred, of course, I'm not asking for a change in principle, you know, you don't change your principles, but the application of those principles should change in times of tumult. And I just don't think we're seeing that. The, the entrenchment, the groupthink, the lack of openness to reason and fact, which underpinned you know, the Christian-based enlightenment, that worries me a great deal. So you've touched on something there that I think is very important, and, and I, I try very hard, I'm sure I often fail to, to remember it myself, but none of us have a monopoly on absolute right and absolute wrong. We all occasionally uh, get it wrong, and whether you're from the left or the right, one of the things that seems to have washed out of the system, though, is the idea that the dividing line between good and evil lies somewhere across every human heart. Now, if we talk about evil, or that old-fashioned word called sin, mm -hmm. it's usually in the, in the, in the sort of... Um, You're a dinosaur. Uh, <laughs> start using those terms. Well, using those terms. Yeah. But we actually do talk in very disparaging terms about the, the terribleness, if you like, of people we disagree with. Mm -hmm. We've lost that understanding. Uh, that we have a shared humanity, we're all a mixture. Mm. It's been washed out. Uh, and if we talk about evil, it's usually in terms of a lack of equality or between uh, the, you know, racial groupings uh, and their inability to get on or but even between men and women now. Mm. But it's never me that's wrong, somehow it's you that's wrong. Yeah. How can a democracy function if, that is become our, if that's become our understanding of right and wrong? I think it's partly because we are not trying to get to know each other anymore. I, I, I think it's partly because of a breakdown in, in, in community that has certainly been exacerbated by social media. I think it's so much easier to say, you know, we are face to face now. And uh, I think if we, you know, we, we can see the reactions on each other's faces, we've just had coffee together, you know, before this interview. I think to be cruel, to someone when there is some basic human connection is a much harder uh, thing to do than when uh, you're completely disembodied in social media over Twitter and Facebook. And I think what has happened is uh, forms of incivility have grown in the, uh, uh, the, the Twitter sphere, in the online world, and we're increasingly seeing those forms of behaviour seep into real life, if you like, uh, uh, general political and, and national uh, discourse. And I generally find that uh, if someone has been horrible or cruel or nasty to me on online media, if I ever do meet them in person, there's an immediate crumpling of their position and an apology. There's something when you are with someone it's not always the case, of course, uh, and, but when you have that real meeting, people, people are different. Somehow, how do we re-establish community between your opponents? How do we find fora where we're connecting with each other again? Um, I don't know the answer, but that should be what we, what we seek. It seems to me to be a huge issue. And to sort of frame it up, the way I see it, is that we now have a virtual global public square. I mean, once a public square was a place, the Roman Senate or whatever, then it became, if you like, the Houses of Parliament in Britain, that was then massively expanded by newspapers, and then by radio and television, now with social media, you've got a virtual public square. Yeah. Given that everyone can express their point of view on it and do so, and that we've become so atomised, the question becomes, how do we learn again to live with our deepest differences? Yeah. And there has to be a, surely at least a willingness to hear the other person as well as 
talk to them or at them if we're going to bridge that divide again. Yeah. One thing I think is we are at early state. It's sometimes it's hard to find causes and of, of optimism when you're confronted with the worst of what's happening at the moment. But my hope is partly based on the fact that we're in the relatively early stages of this social yeah. media phenomenon. And, and throughout human history, there's often a move towards you know, a revolutionary technology or a revolutionary idea takes hold for a period and there's often then a reaction to it. Um, and I think we're beginning to see that reaction with a lot of people, for example, closing down their Facebook accounts yeah. now. Especially young people. Yeah, because they don't like the distraction element, they don't like the, 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 the hot nature of a lot of the debate, the personal nature of it. And it may well be that you know, now on my iPhone, I um, have a monitor of my screen time. And when I see the number of hours I have spent on that phone, it's horrifying. Maybe they're going to be technological as well as other cultural responses to this, um, much more profound than those little ones that I've just mentioned. Uh, that will allow us to recreate community that, will, that people will start judging uh, very nasty reactions on Twitter and that will become the, the greater sin in a next generation's uh, cultural development. That what we are currently living through, a rush to take offence, a rush to think the worst of people, that uh, as a first resort uh, people will come to regard people who engage in that behaviour very badly. Maybe it's a forlorn, forlorn hope. Well, <laughs> it's a hope. We have to cling to it. We've got yeah. to try and make it a reality. Now, there's an enormous, uh, if you like, contradiction at the heart of all of this. We live in what's called an empathy culture, where at one level we're told the worst sin of all is to offend another person, mm -hmm. particularly if that person's a self-identified victim. You mm -hmm. must not offend them. Yeah. That is to confirm their victimhood. On the other hand, often the same people, it seems to me, armed with a keyboard, will absolutely shred anybody who dares to disagree with them. Mm. How do we fit? Why is it that people can't see the contradiction? Uh, there's, it's perhaps one of the biggest growth industries in the world at the moment is the victimhood uh, industry. And uh, I worry that it's taking place on the right as much on yes. the left. And, I think one of the leading characteristics really of the whole Donald Trump phenomenon is he's turned a lot of the right into thinking that they are victims of uh, culture and economic and technological change. And of course some of them are. There are some real victims of the changes that we're seeing um, out there. But to think of yourself as a victim, not masters of your own destiny, captains of your own ship, if, it's, it, I think it's an infantilization really of people and culture. So I don't think I'm quite answering your question directly. But Not sure that anyone can. No, but yeah. I think the beginning is, the beginning, just as we were talking in terms of social media a few, a few minutes ago, I think the beginning of solution, uh, finding a solution, is an awareness of the problem, an awareness of how we're behaving. And to recognise our own tendency uh, within each of us, you, you talked about, you know, sin passes through the hearts of you know every person. That, that, that's right, but uh, the tendency to see ourselves as victims and unjustly treated is too. And perhaps we can all we can all look to personal reform before we look to wider social reform. Well, that's the Jordan Peterson line. He makes the point that redemption will not be at the level of the political. And you and I have both been involved in politics, mm. but rather at the level of the individual. And I'm sure that is a profound insight. Mm. Uh, and uh, we talk about collective action. Of course, we have to act collectively, but we need to be coming, if you like, to a place when we want to engage in collective activism from a well-sorted personal point of view so that we're not out there simply seeking to smash and destroy because we're angry or we're victims. Mm. I think we need to find our feet again. And what's really interesting about the whole Jordan Peterson thing is that so many young people, in this country anyway, mm. That, you know, the, the, the venues that he spoke at were sold out within minutes of going yeah. online. Same in London. Big wake-up call uh, for, I would have thought, a lot of today's intelligentsia who have been very, very reluctant to grapple with the fact that a lot of young people are not all that taken with the so-called empathy culture. They know there's more to life.
that they, they do. And it's a very encouraging phenomenon that uh, he's emerged. But uh, linking some of the themes that we, we've been talking about, the hostility that he has faced. Mm. And when you, when you see a university like the University of Cambridge, yeah. supposedly one of the elite uh, academies of learning, and I think of learning as a, should be of, of openness to new ideas, when a university like Cambridge in my own country uh, refuses to engage with Jordan Peterson, turns him away. I think it's sort of a yet another illustration of the, of the problems we've been talking about. Well, actually, as, a, as an aside, as we've seen in our country, resistance to the idea of teaching Western culture in our universities because supposedly it's all about white supremacy and what have you. I think the real reason is a lot of those universities know that if those courses were offered, a lot of their students would give up the pretty fluffy stuff yeah. that many of those universities are offering. That's part of it. And this uh, is the Ramsey Foundation. The Ramsey, yeah. yeah Centre yeah. for Western Civilization, yeah. study of Western Civilization. Um, I don't see how you can ever locate where you are, let alone work out where to go in an uncertain time if you don't understand your past. And you don't have to, you know, um, be glib and whitewash it. You can learn from the mistakes as well as the things we got right. I think we always learn more from our mistakes. Yeah. So why not teach them properly and accurately? And personally, I'm not saying I'm any great shakes, but if I've ever grown and advanced as a human being, it's very often been because I've had to hear something very uncomfortable. I think we grow more out of realising sometimes that we've failed, we've got it wrong. We're not as good as we think we are uh, that, uh, than, than when we're being patted on the back and told, there, there, you're the centre of the universe and everything you believe in is absolutely right. Well, for, in, you know, in capitalism, in a, sort of a parallel example of this, uh, I think people look at capitalism as driven by profit. Actually, I think it's most driven by loss. Uh, because the, the, when you're making money, you carry on doing pretty much what you started doing. And that mean, you know, that's the reward for a successful innovation. But it's loss when things start turning down, when businesses and sectors hit trouble. That's when you get the real sort of new comp competitors emerge, or you close down doing things that aren't working anymore. That's what makes capitalism the hugely dynamic force it is in the world. Often I find in government, you'll be a better person having served in government, um, it's actually the reverse incentive structure. I think it was Milton Friedman who, you know, who talked about, uh, about this. In government, when things start going wrong, it's often a tendency, because you don't want it to become a matter of public, more money mm. is thrown at the thing that isn't working, because you don't want to admit defeat. Mm. And it's, it's that willingness to react to loss, to react to mistakes, to learn from error, to learn from criticism, if we stop doing that, then we really are doomed. Well, I can't argue with that. Although, to pick up something you've just said there, profit is often now painted as a dirty word. Mm. In fact, properly understood, profit is a very good thing. It's lifted countless, countless numbers of people out of poverty. Yep. If the ground rules are fair, mm. and I produce two sweaters, but I only need one, you're producing a fat lamb mm -hmm. and you've got an excess one and you're the we want to do a you're swap. You're the farmer, you should be the one talking about <laughs> producing But my point is that yeah. you know, we can do a trade and we both profit. Yeah. We're both, in our own view, further ahead than we would otherwise have been. And the retention of profit and it's ploughing back into further production mm -hmm. is what has lifted countless, countless people out of poverty. Yeah. Well, I don't, what, painted as I don't know what your world. answer to this question would be, but if I could be sort of given this uh, uh, opportunity to live in any time in world history, I think it would be now, or, or similar to now, because this is a time when, because of people pursuing profit, um, the medicines that we have, the freedoms, the technologies, the, the escape from boredom are unparalleled, really. If you are a woman or a minority, the opportunities are much greater than they were in, in periods of, 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 of greater prejudice. There are plenty of things going wrong in the world at the moment. I think the weakness of family and community and the social media culture that we've been discussing. But I think these are problems that we need to strive to fix and to be grateful for, for what uh, Western civilization has produced. I think most of these benefits have been produced on the back of Western civilization's commitment to learning and reason and to the Christian ethic of our looking after one's 
one's neighbour. So amongst the gloom, uh, let's be uh, grateful for what has been achieved and, uh, and off the back of this, uh, of this set of uh, the, the rich inheritance we enjoy. Well, I find that hard to argue with. It's a useful segue, though, into something uh, uh, that I think you and I would both uh, posit, which is that uh, sound economics, which would be painted as conservatism by some, uh, actually, I think, can be and is, properly done, very compassionate. The left will often argue that compassion means high levels of taxation and high levels of redistribution. In fact, I would argue that that can be in a, a, a total failure and deliver very bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. You've often used the term, I think, compassionate conservatism. What do you mean by that? The best book I've read on um, Margaret Thatcher um, was a book um, by Shirley Robin Letwin. I don't know whether you've come across it personally, but it's uh, a book written by um, Oliver Letwin, who's currently a Conservative MP, the mother. And she uh, frames Thatcherism um, as a creed of individualism, but not a creed of individualism I think it's understood today. I think a lot of people think of uh, individualism as a sort of what I want, me, now, I, an indifference to anyone else, a sort of a, a selfish um, uh, individualism. And and Shelley Robin Letwin in this book said, if you look at how Mrs Thatcher always understood it, particularly in, I think, one of the best speeches ever given on the link between Christianity and public policy, a speech that Margaret Thatcher gave in 1988 to the Church of Scotland, and a speech I know you're very familiar with. It's uh, a remarkable John. speech. Yeah. The Sermon on the Mound, yeah. it was nicknamed no, of. I've been in the, in, the, in the business of trying to give speeches and listening to speeches. Mm. And it's up there with the best, that one. Yeah, it's I an extraordinary it, speech. And easy to find online for any of your people yeah. watching or listening to, uh, to this. But uh, in that speech in 1980 and how Shirley Robin Letwin describes this, it was an individualism absolutely rooted in a social context of family, community, neighbourhood. Uh, of an individualism taking the best from Western civilization, an idea of a noble individualism. And Shirley Robin Wetman talks about, Mrs. Thatcher really believed in the vigorous virtues uh, of courage, of uprightness, of sacrifice, of people who would do the best for other, other people. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher was uh, first a Methodist by background, and you know, one of the great Methodists of, of history, Wesley said, you know, earn, his, his, his motto, which Mrs. Thatcher often people, earn as much as you can, save as much as you can, give as much as you can. So long answer to your question, but this is a, what I think is at the heart of compassionate conservatism. Not setting people free to do whatever they want, but setting them free in the context of a Judeo-Christian civilization and an ethic of community where they serve other people. They serve people through philanthropy, through job creation, through public service. And Mrs. Thatcher was horrified towards the end of the 80s. It's partly why she started giving speeches like she did to the Church of Scotland. That when her policies had helped a lot of people become rich, yes, there was a lot of social benefit to them creating jobs off the back of their own wealth, the, you know, the, the, the products that they created that reduced the price of consumer goods, allowed uh, people to be liberated from the homes, from you know, back-breaking labour, etc. But she thought that the very rich would also give much more, that they would be more philanthropic. And she was very disappointed at, at that lack of willingness to, to be socially responsible. And I think that's part of the challenge for Conservatives today, is to remember that we are not just a, an economic creed, that the most important thing in life is not, is not money. Uh, I don't know whether you've read the book by David Brooks, uh, where he talks about the difference between resume yes. values yes. and eulogy values. Yes. What, what do you lead you know, your, your life for? Do you take decisions for what you can put in your curriculum vitae, or do you lead a life that well, when someone's giving your eulogy at your funeral, the, do you live your life for what could be said of you then? And sometimes I think too often the right 
looks like a resume party or resume philosophy rather than a eulogy philosophy, a, a eulogy politics. And for me, compassionate conservatism is moving us back to the best of our traditions. There's a bunch of issues there. I've always tried to say when people have said, do you believe in the individual or put that view, I've said, yes, I do. But if I believe in the individual, uh, then I have to say, you're also an individual mm. and you're of worth, you're of value. Now that's, if you like the Christian creed, do unto your neighbour yeah. as you would have them do unto you. It's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, if that's applied to capitalism, then it plays into what you're talking about. The capitalism that is easily caricatured today because it's true, I'm afraid, of too many wealthy people, too many influential people. We've seen it here with a commission of inquiry into the banks and the financial sector that gives, uh, gives banking uh, and, and capitalism a bad name is when it's, it's, it seems to be purely profit-driven for the benefit of those in the game yep. rather than people doing what they ought to do without coercion and behaving honourably and generously. Yep. So it raises an interesting point for me when you talk about Thatcher's disappointment in, in, in how people uh, you know, approached and used their newfound wealth. What comes first with the fracturing of Western society? People in this country complain endlessly about the political process breaking down, revolving door leadership and what have you. And it, it, I'm not denying it's not a real problem, but what comes first? The fracturing of our politics in a democracy or the fracturing of our society then being reflected in a fracturing of our politics? Well, undoubtedly, the, the fracturing of society comes first, I think. For, uh, I think if one of the criticism you could make of a lot of people on the right, a lot of the um, generous donate, donate, donors to political parties on the right is that we focus too much on politics. And, 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 and politics is downstream of education and religion and, uh, and culture. The values on, that we see in the Hollywood films that we watch, in the plays on Broadway, in Leicester Square, um, the, uh, the, what is taught in our universities, uh, uh, what is taught, what, what is preached in pulpits and in synagogues and in mosques. Um, these are the big values from which later are, are, are how we vote flows. And so it's very difficult for a political culture to be strong if all other parts of um, society are, are weak. So I think it, there's a challenge for those of us of the conservative disposition to pay an awful lot more attention to the institutions that the left purposely marched through. Yes. Well, we've won a lot of economic battles in, in recent decades. The John Howard years, of which you were a principal part, um, the uh, Thatcher years, the Reagan years. But during those periods, I think, the left were marching through the universities. They were marching through religious institutions, taking over the commanding cultural heights of our society. Somehow we have to inspire the next generation in the way that Jordan Peterson and other people you know, are beginning to do, to, 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 to mount our own march through those institutions or start, start creating alternative institutions um, to those. One institution I would love a Conservative government in Britain, and I'm a, part, a small part of a campaign to do this, is to set up a museum of communism. Right. If I, if, I, if I took off my shirt mm. in this interview now, and don't worry, <laughs> I won't frighten your uh, viewers and listeners, but if I had a swastika, a T-shirt with a swastika on, rightly, it would be regarded as a, an appalling... Yeah. If I took off my shirt and I had a picture of Lenin, a red star or a hammer and sickle, I know you'd be disappointed in me, but it would not be regarded as socially unacceptable in the way a Nazi um, rightly uh, would be. But if you look at communism, you look at those, uh, that philosophy, many more people died. Many more people are still dying. So only this week, trucks, police trucks, uh, in a sort of echo of Chinaman Square, overrunning protesters in, Vene in Venezuela. Somehow I think we need to teach uh, the young, that when you have large-scale collectivization, when you do squash the individual and freedom as communism and socialism inevitably do in their, in their logical progression towards greater and greater 
state control. It's, it's, it's an evil and dangerous philosophy and we need to start creating institutions like that uh, that begin to change the culture. Not everything can be done by government but I think that's an illustration of something that could be done by government. But it's hard, we've got a conservative government or conservative government of a certain kind in, in London but there's no real interest or enthusiasm in doing this. I don't know if it was proposed in, in Australia, whether the, Liber the Liberal Party would embrace it, but what, we need to be thinking in those terms. You're, you're seeing a very deepening, a rapidly deepening awareness of how, how, how serious the cultural malaise is in this country. Mm. Uh, and I would say uh, quite unashamedly that um, our tertiary institutions in particular need to realise that they are losing it mm -hmm. with the people now. They're being seen to be arrogant and dismissive. And the Ramsey Centre for uh, the study of Western civilization, the reaction to it, and the clear implication that many academics believe that we're terrible white supremacists, uh, that we're uh, you know the sons and daughters of neo uh, of, of co colonialist forces yeah. that have been horrible, and that far from being free and open societies and good places to live, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. It doesn't wash with ordinary people, mm. but how do they push back? Well, you're starting to see some pushback, and that's important. Uh, but it's going to be a very, very long haul indeed. One of the main reasons for that, I believe, is that the left, following Karl Marx's dictum that a people deprived of their history are easily persuaded, have made certain that we don't understand our history. So for everyone who wants to point to some ugly aspect of uh, colonisation and it was there, I would want to put up uh, you know, a William Wilberforce or a, a Lord Shaftesbury or even an Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. And so these were great Greatest and noble heroes, people. Yeah who did incredible things. Think of a Wilberforce, he had everything to lose as a man of high position and great wealth seen as a future Prime Minister by identifying with, with, with people who were not even seen as human beings, are seen as goods and chattels, the slaves. But he did it. It was an unbelievable. How can you take away that nobility? But it's not taught anymore. Why is it not taught? Well, it confronts you with a terrible problem. Here is a man who plainly acted out of deep Christian conviction doing things that no one could criticise. Mm. No one could criticise. Leading mm. the greatest human rights movement of all time. Absolutely, yeah. Well, you don't want unfortunate facts like get that getting in the way if you want to demonise our past and say it was all bad. Yeah. And there are awful lots of aspects of British empire which are shameful. Yes. But you know, there are stories also of once William Wilberforce had achieved his aim and a huge part of that, of course, he was 40 years of fighting. You know, yeah. his, his perseverance is one of the greatest qualities that anyone can bring to any cause. Mm. He had so many defeats yes. you know, along that path. But he but kept he, going. He kept at it. And of course, he was tactical as well. Yeah. First of all, he only wanted to campaign for the abolition of the slave trade. Mm. And lots of purists so said... Go for slavery. Yeah, and he didn't think that was possible. No. That pragmatism is sometimes mm. missing from mm. uh, Christians and other you know, morally serious mm. campaign. Sometimes half a cup is better than no cup at all. And of course, as soon as he had achieved his um, first mission of abolishing the slave trade, he, he, he began the movement to abolish slavery altogether. But um, uh, what, what happened, of course, once he had succeeded in that, was we had the Royal Navy uh, going around the world and African slave ports destroying those ports. Yeah. The, 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 the British Navy that in so many of our universities would have only been seen in negative terms uh, it, it, as, it, as, as sort of taught in history, performed an incredibly important moral function. And uh, yes, there's, oh, I'm not arguing, I'm sure you're not arguing for the worst parts of our history to be swept under No, but the I am carpet. arguing they will be taught and taught honestly. Yeah. The good and the bad taught honestly. We yep. learn from the things we got right, mm -hmm. we learn from the things we got wrong. Yep. But if we don't understand either, Mm. We're right where we're at in Western society now, it seems to me. Mm. Unable to locate where we are, mm -hmm. because we don't know where we've come from, and unable to identify how to strike out in the right direction. Yep. And I think we owe our children better. Yep. And I think they're looking for better. Yep. I have four children and I now have grandchildren and children-in-law, which is wonderful, and I'm looking to their future. I've had a wonderful life in a free society that's given me great opportunity. I desperately hope that my children and grandchildren will enjoy the same. 
given the fractures, given the challenges, internal and external, actually confronting Australia and, let's face it, uh, your country as well, what qualities of leadership, that are, and everyone's crying out for leadership, mm -hmm. are going to be needed in your view? I think I'd emphasise three things. One would be conviction. I think we're desperately short of leaders who absolutely know, particularly on the right, who absolutely know what they stand for. I've been in Australia, I've been talking to the uh, Centre for Independent Studies about Margaret Thatcher. There's someone you always knew where she stood for. You know, she wanted to release the potential of the British people again, and uh, which had been uh, suppressed, I think, by union and government power uh, and misuse of that, of that power. Um, the second thing was um, a pragmatism. She, she, she displayed a, a pragmatism. Much of Britain was left untouched mm. by her. She didn't reform the universities. She no, didn't reform the National Health Service. She basically yeah. touched the welfare state. She knew that there were certain battles she had to win mm. because they were urgent and pressing, like the battle against the unions, the, the battle against uh, in, uh, Russia, the, the evil empire, the unions it then was, um, and the Cold War. She needed to win the battle of nuclear deterrence to station nuclear weapons in Britain. Um, but the third quality, conviction, pragmatism, but courage. 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 Because there, is, there are plenty of people in Britain, there are plenty of people in British politics who shared Mrs Thatcher's beliefs and outlook. But were they willing to fight for it? Were they willing to put up with the flack that, that she took? I partly, I think, one of the reasons why she was so strong and had so much courage was she was, you know, it's still a man's world to a large extent now, but the 1970s that she emerged through as to become Britain's first female prime minister were much more sexist, much more misogynistic than anything with, is, is true now. And she had to fight to get to the to get to the top. And she had to fight to stay at the top. And I think that grit, that determination, allied in conviction, meant that she was able to achieve victories um, that many people b before her had tried to fight but were unable to win. I was amazingly encouraged to hear Jordan Peterson say to young Australians, that when they'd sorted themselves out, they should go out and be as noble as they can be and set themselves high bars and strive to meet them. We need leaders of that sort of character now. I'm certain that there are people who are prepared to pick up that challenge. We just need to make certain that we give them the nourishment and the encouragement they need to do so. Absolutely. And I, I really am an admirer of what you're trying to do here in these conversations and as one contribution to just helping people along that path, I think these are great, uh, these are great uh, works and uh, my favourite film is It's a Wonderful Life, you know, usually shown at um, Christmas, I don't know whether you're a fan as well, but that whole idea running through that film that we don't often know the the little things that we do in life, the encouragements that we give to young people, our neighbours, they may not look like they matter at the time, but if we had the advantage of an angel like Clarence to show us what our life had, had, uh, had contributed to, um, I think it might well be that the little things that we did mattered most. And I think encouraging the young, emboldening the young, encouraging the young to really uh, strike out for their ideals and beliefs, not, much, not many more important tasks than that. As long as we're honest and tell them it's not going to be easy, this thing that you hear at school, uh, speech days and, all the time, or, and so forth all the time, you're going to have your cake and eat it too. You can do it all. It's not true. It's not true. Yeah. You actually have to make tough choices. And if you want to make a difference, you've got to be prepared to put a lot of things down and sacrifice a great deal. Yeah, and, and, and linking that with our conversation about William Wilberforce, he absolutely was one who had to fight hard again and again and again through much ridicule and opposition. But he didn't do it alone. He, he, he was a, someone of great perseverance, but he was part of the Clapham sect of, as, as it was called, of other evangelicals and other non-believers. Non they were there to, 
support him through that task. Great tasks need application, they need sacrifice, they need courage, but they also need community. And perhaps the final observation to make about William Wilberforce that we should hold up as an example was that he was a man born into a fortune, perhaps in today's money in Australia, around 400 million. What? Gosh, he died yeah. with virtually nothing in one mm. of his children's homes because he'd spent not only his earnings, but also his capital mm. trying to create a better world. Mm -hmm. Now that's the sort of model we ought to be describing to our children. Amen. Thank you.